So thank you guys, thank you for joining us today. Um, great to see some familiar faces and some new ones as well, brilliant. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, hopefully you know this already, but will COVID change the way that we sell forever? Um, and we have the fantastic Claire Forestier, Forestier, <laughs> moderating the discussion today. So um, Claire's an event host and a virtual MC, and she coaches people to make the most of um, presenting live at these virtual events, which we are oh so familiar with these days. Um, and we are um, pretty pushed for time. We've got 45 minutes. We're going to have a sharp kickoff with three minutes late, so we'll crack straight in. Um, and I'll hand you over to uh, Claire Forresty. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Can I ask you all to mute if you're not muted? Because Judah has control of mute. I don't. So if you could mute, that would be brilliant. And I will then be coming to panelists when we get to them. So as you know, we are going to be talking about how COVID is changing the way we sell and is it going to continue like this or not? So I'm really interested to find out, but I'm going to start off by introducing today's panel. So first of all, we've got Rachel Howard, who's the founder and director of Momentum Southwest. She and her team deliver business coaching and strategy to SMEs across the region. We're also joined by Martin Baines, the no-nonsense sales trainer. His company, Martin Baines Learning Solutions, creates bespoke training programs. And Charlotte Travers is the development manager at the digital marketing company Social B, and they aim to help businesses transform the way they appear on social media. And Andrew Bryce, last but not least, is the founder and CEO of 60 Seconds. His business platform allows companies to simply and very quickly make brand aligned videos. And um, Andrew's background actually is recruiting and digital marketing. Okay, so I'm gonna start with all of you. A general quick question, first of all, what's been your personal experience at selling at this kind of unique, weird time? What are the pros and cons you found for your own businesses? So I'm gonna start with Martin. Yeah, interesting, thanks. Uh, hi everybody, welcome along, thanks for joining us. Um, challenges, yes, yeah, challenging times, isn't it? Moving everything from face-to-face -face delivery of the sales training, management training I do, moving that onto an online platform um, and getting used to um, the functionality of these these platforms like Zoom, 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 I, sh I should say, Zoomatitis I've got right now. So yeah, it's just kind of the, the shift. I ain't gonna use the word pivot. It's the shift from face-to-face -to, -face to online, really. Okay, thank you. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. So, since the COVID kind of things all happened for us, uh, we've gone down the route of helping, not selling, trying to use this time to build our pipeline of people, find out what new challenges they're facing. Uh, and then see where we can then pivot our service and our offering to then help them uh, align with those challenges. Um, so we've had more conversations than ever before, not necessarily buying now, but definitely warming our pipeline for when this is all come to a close. Yeah, I think anyone working digitally already is, is having that nice hot pipeline at least. Um, and for everyone else, it's a big shift. Rachel, what about you and the way you guys work? What's the changes been for your business? Yeah, I think the big thing for us has been asking all of our clients how they like to be communicated with and when and by what channel. So some people are enjoying Zoom, some would prefer a quick WhatsApp or a text, some would prefer early in the morning, others would prefer in the evening. So I think the number one rule really is to ask the client how do you want to be communicated with so that you make sure that the communication lands well because you're you're doing it tailored to what they need okay all right thank you charlotte what about you guys again social media and social media presence is all what is all that you do is that your business is presumably doing nicely thank you very much <laughs> I, I i wish it was better um i i think when we're not flush for for work um, at the minute we've furloughed a few I've had process of moving all of our training online so trying to adapt things to be as interactive and as uh, efficient as possible via zoom uh, comes to training um, and then also we, we work with people in the b2b space so for us it's more about working out who we can help at the moment um rather than uh rather than working how we've always worked okay all right okay that's interesting so yeah it's 
it's it's not quite as we might expect for everybody it's 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 we're, there, there's a different story from everyone and we can, the assumptions that it's all easy for digital is not necessarily a way forward okay thank you guys rachel um if i come to you now i had a question really there was something you mentioned in, a, in our previous chat about the fact that we're having all these conversations and you're having them and people like to have them online a lot more easily than in person don't they is that meaning that you are we're, you're better prepared when you actually get into the sales kind of conversations with people the way that we're talking now the way that we're communicating with people like i'm using video a lot so people know more about me does that make selling easier in a way i think we've all got to recognize the big differences with selling online versus selling in a face-to-face -face meeting and i think if you know a, a great example of if we look at each other now on this video we're all square onto the camera we're quite close to the camera and if you imagine that in a face-to-face -face environment and compare it it's quite intense mm. um, it's the same as being sat next to somebody leaning right into their space which if we were sat in a coffee shop or a business meeting wouldn't be particularly comfortable so i think you know the key thing with zoom is to remember your your body language is still important even though there's a screen in between you and the person sometimes i think if you're if you're asking um, a really important question or maybe a slightly intrusive question which you sometimes have to do when you're selling to remember that body language you know maybe turn side on maybe tilt your head when when the person's answering you maybe sit back so that you can you know appear more reflective that you're listening i think that body language is still important because if if all we are is you know like news readers on a screen staring into someone's face that can be quite intense on zoom so that would be my main point so there's a very di yeah there's a difference so what you're doing online depend you sit and complete do things differently depending how you're working so i'm all about telling people how to present themselves well do this but if you're actually going to be selling one-to-one -one with someone or having a conversation one-to-one -one, it needs to be a little bit more you know yeah, I mean, the, the elephant in the room question in any sales um, conversation is, you know, what's your budget? How, how much are you expecting to spend on this? And if you ask that square up to the screen and quite close in, that question that's already a tricky question becomes even more intimidating. So I think just think about, think about your presence and think about the way that you're actually appearing online. That is, that is very interesting. One other thing that I know we talked about yesterday was it that, that potentially there could be because you're getting these lovely relationships going almost before you meet people and you're not having to necessarily meet them. Is that meaning that you can potentially this way mean a general reduction in the time to buy? Does it change the touch points a bit? I, th I think you can expect to reduce the touch points. Um, usually the number one thing in, in um, opening up a sales relationship is to build rapport. And often people think rapport is chatting about the weather or chatting about what's going on in the coffee shop that you're in or whatever. Um, but that's not what rapport is. Rapport is finding common ground with somebody. And actually, if you if you ask really good questions because you're preparing well for every interaction, then actually you could expect that the average touch points in a B2B uh, sales journey would be 10. I would expect to see that come down because we get better prepared. You can't wing it on a zoom call you can't expect to just meet and go oh, hi you know good to catch up you have to be prepared because a silence a difficult silence on a zoom call is is much harder to just gloss over so i think that preparation should help to speed up the process also building rapport with people somehow seems easier at this time because you you've all got a really shared experience at the very beginning of the call mm. to talk about what how people are doing in covid because everybody is going through it where that's not normally the case when you have a new conversation with someone you've no idea at least you know that everybody is pretty much at home and have had the similar experiences so that yeah. i think really helps build rapport mm. um andrew obviously videos about <laughs> a way of a short quick way of, of building rapport short quick you know what i mean a sure fired and quick way to build rapport if you get it right how important is video in the sales process now obviously you're going to say a lot but, but <laughs> yeah I, I'm, I'm a bit biased i'll probably say a lot but i do think that uh, going back to shortening the touch points a lot of those initial touch points can actually be delivered via video so if you're putting out some video on social media you can then target your specific 
clientele. Um, you can then prospect them automatically, which automates the social sourcing side, which saves uh, sales teams a huge amount of time, which is actually finding the ideal prospects. Uh, and then you can deliver two to three bits of video before you even have a conversation with that buyer. Uh, and they instantly know you, they recognize you from the video. So you've already got that rapport kind of build up with them. Um, and then you focus on the end of the sales pipeline so you can make those relationships win their trust, which they already have a bit of before then selling. And I think a lot of that can be delivered via video. Um, and I think we're consuming video a lot better right now. Uh, and we're co really comfortable during this time. Yeah, so we're talking there about kind of a new, not new way, but a new way for certain people to sell what they do. I know, Martin, you've talked about cold calling and things a lot in, in, when you, in you're doing your training. How is the way we do that, that sort of prospecting calls, how are you finding that's changed? Is it because of the use of video or the, the rapport that you can build up? Yeah, it's interesting because lots of people say, should I be prospecting in these challenging times? And my response is, absolutely, you should. We have to do this on a regular basis. And I think Andrew's, it's typical, isn't it? When I come on, the phone rings in the bloody background, sorry. <laughs> um, I think Andrew's hit the nail on the head there because... Yes, of course you can pick up the phone um, and speak to somebody that you've never had any interaction with. But do you know what? Why on earth would you when you've got all of the socials that Charlotte's going to talk about um, and you can warm people up? People get to know people by doing short, sharp, quick videos. So I think it just kind of integrates in. And, 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 and yes, you've got to still be doing this, but in a way that makes it easier for people to go, oh yeah, um, that guy looks okay, I can speak to him. And, and go back to Rachel's point, I literally had a conversation this morning with somebody who wants to, to put some sales training into their business. And actually they want to integrate how to read body language using remote platforms like Zoom into that call, into that course. So it's going to be something I think that is, is going to be part of the way we sell over at least the next six months, possibly 12 to 18, personally. Do you not just think it would just go on if people have found it successful? It's not just going to continue. Like we're talking about will things change forever? Is this not going to be one thing that will potentially change forever? Quite possibly, yes. I mean, I've spoken to people who say, yeah, we'll have a meeting and I'll, I'll come to you. And it actually, a 20-minute meeting can turn into two and a half, three hours of your day. So if there is a more practical solution to it, you know, then why wouldn't you? But you've got to have the, the, the skills and the, uh, the knowledge to be able to build rapport remotely. I think that's really important. Well, that's, a, that's something that people need to, if they want to do it and, and you know, maximise this opportunity in this new way of selling, then they absolutely have to kind of get prepped for it and instructed on it and, and not just pretend to do it and start clueless. Yeah. So yeah. And I don't know about the other guys, you know, going off, at, you know, the phone's just rung in my house in the background. And, and I'm sure you've all been on Zoom calls where the dog or the cat has come across the screen. And, you know, and there's that line, isn't there, between um, professionalism, but being professional whilst at home. Yeah. So having a dedicated area, he says, working from the kitchen because there's no Wi-Fi in the office. But you take my point, you know, it's that balance of getting it right and maintaining that professionalism. I think whilst we're in lockdown, it's excusable. If we continue working as we are outside of lockdown, then we are going to have to be a little bit more professional. You know, nobody wants to look at a cat's ass in the middle of a meeting when you're actually back in the office. But yeah. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's better than yeah better than some things you could see I i'm suppose. not answering that one no, uh, no. I'll let somebody else let me, let's quickly move on i did have a conversation actually with someone this morning who's a video mar who's a what do you call it um network marketer and she's already sold to me so she was just doing a nice phone call to a client but she said she's finding it so much easier because instead of having to go to people's houses she can just do a quick 15 minute phone call with them and show them on their video screen and she says people don't mind that because it's much easier to put they don't feel pressured in the same way to have a 15 minute call with you. I think, and I've no, probably everybody's noticed, people will pick up the phone and have a call with you now much more quickly or a Zoom than they might have done to set up with face to face. So from those, in that way, it's definitely working. If I come to you now, because we've been talking, this is to Charlotte, about, about quick video and so on. So you've got to be socially, you know, social media has to be up to scratch to sell this way, doesn't it? So yeah, completely. the tone and stuff is changing as well, hasn't it? I've noticed that. So what, what, mm. just from a professional's point of view, what have you Well, noticed? I think if you, if you think about it, LinkedIn is now your, it's your networking event. 
it's your customer service tool, it's your lead generator, it's so much more now. I think, I think as sales, and I don't know about the rest of you, I know Martin said that prospecting is still so important right now, but me personally, it, it feels a bit gross. I, I don't know if I'm overly sensitive to it, but selling or cold, cold calling right now feels, it feels a bit too much for me. Mm. So I think if anyone else feels like that, then there's immense pressure on your marketing. It, it throws huge, huge pressure on being, to be honest, to being shit hot on social or, you know, your website needs to be really, really good. Um, and I think I'm finding that even though people aren't necessarily buying right now, they're certainly researching. Yeah. So there, there, needs to be, there needs to be a presence there and that presence needs to be memorable because potentially they're making, they're making you know, research for decisions that are going to be in six months. That's a, yeah, that's a very interesting way of looking at it, actually. It is like the prospecting in a research way and that feels less mm -hmm. icky to do maybe as well. You know, Martin, yeah, you have, you've said that definitely before, haven't you? You don't have to ring people up to say, yeah. how can I help? You can ring them up and go, literally, I am just trying to find out how to help people at the moment. I'm not trying to sell to you. And that feels nicer, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think when it comes to video, there's, you, you can have no sales agenda now with video. You mm. can give value, straight away value. Mm. And that's what people want. And that is, like I said, that's what people will remember. Um, and one point I wanted to mention on the, will, will meetings stay virtual? I think there's a part of me that, that thinks, yes, of course they should, you know, we're all getting used to Zoom, we're all learning so much more about it. But if you found out that your competitor was going face to face, would you change your mind about also going? Because I think six months ago when none of this was an issue, there was always the temptation to do it via Zoom, but we're scared. That's such an interesting point because I know I was very, I do a lot of virtual stuff, but I liked to do one-to-ones in person because I felt that's how you got the rapport. But you now realise how time consuming that was. But yeah. then if everybody else starts doing it again, like, there'll probably be a backlash initially, I think. Do people agree? I think there'll be a bit backlash eventually. So, uh, I think that there's a big shift from face-to-face -face and then Zoom. You've got to have different etiquette. You've got to kind of be trained to do it. So what COVID's done is actually trained us all to be used to Zoom, right? Mm. So we've all become uh, comfortable with us, ourselves on it because you've got to think you're looking at yourself a lot of the time and you don't get to see that in a face-to-face -face meeting. It was one of my barriers to entry to doing any video was I've got to see how I look on the video before I put it out and it's the biggest fear, right? So once you kind of get used to that and you, you find your own mannerisms and you get used to what you're doing, you build up that confidence uh, and then that starts to come through in your sales pitch uh, and then it exudes the other one with confidence. Um, so I think that the reason it's become more successful now <coughs> is everyone's used to it, whereas previously I would shy away from doing a Zoom call because I knew I was infinitely better in person when I met with someone. Now I think it's completely different because I have a different tactic right now to in person. I probably put on a bit more um put a bit more energy into it type thing uh, because it's a sales pitch um, and you come across better on camera isn't that interesting so we're getting the best of andrew now if we meet you then in real life you might be really boring, Absolutely. <laughs> I'm really boring in real life. <laughs> that is true i talk about that all the time you have to bring your a game on online you can't bring whereas you could go to a meeting and not necessarily take your a game in the same way because people feed all the other they get all the other cues off you don't they and all the other social things that you do to 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 understand your mood and stuff online there is none of that so yeah that's a very interesting point thank you i had a, um, a good question now well it's not my question so i can say it's a, it's a good question which um is for you guys is to we started talking about the rapport and stuff but one of the questions that you guys have come up with which i really like is how do you advise people now who are in sales you know there's two of you on the call who are in the sales training business what what are you telling your clients about how they talk to their sales teams and work with their sales teams? Because a lot of traditional sales is, is very much people are in there, they're, they're seeing what their team are doing. This way, they're not seeing what their teams are doing. Their teams are working remotely. How do you motivate them? How do you check on what they're doing? All that kind of thing. How, what's the advice you're giving your clients, Martin and Rachel? I'll come to you first, Martin. Uh, yeah, it's a great point, isn't it? Um, and I think we'll look forward before we look in the present I think you know there will be more teams hopefully working from home because when it works it works it cuts down on travel costs and all of that kind of stuff but I think 
it's that trust element of trusting that the people are going to be working, but not micromanaging sales teams, but letting people get on with it, I think is, is massively important because if I'm trusted by my manager that I'm going to do a job, you wouldn't have employed me in the first place, let's be honest, from a recruitment perspective, um, and actually let me get on with it. Let me get on with it and, and just to be there in terms of support, that support mechanism as and when I need it. I don't know, Rach, what you think? But with, I was going to say, with certain organisations, they're going to have to adjust their business model, aren't they? From Rachel Law Martin. I, I mean, from I, I've got a lot of experience in this area because I used to manage a remote sales team for many, many years. Um, so the, I, I left a job back in 2016 where I had 60 sales staff all over the UK and the frequency that I would see them face to face as the sales director was once a quarter and sometimes that was the maximum I would see them and so the structure that you had to put in place to manage them had to be really really good so the communication was you know eight o'clock Monday morning team call um, on a Friday afternoon, four or five o'clock team call, and it would just be a fun call. What are you doing for the weekend? You know, how was your week? Sharing best practice, sharing, you know, good news. But I think around that, any good sales manager needs to um, not manage revenue. Revenue should never be a, a target ever because revenue is purely an output of doing two other things really, really well. One is activity and the other is conversion activity shows how hard your sales team are trying and conversion shows how good they are at it and whether or not they might need any training or coaching and so by just shouting about a revenue target it doesn't actually get you anything as a sales leader it doesn't it doesn't drive a result it just makes you look like a sales manager that wants to shout a lot and if you support your team by driving activity and then you help them by observing their conversion rate and figuring out who's got the best conversion rate, maybe who hasn't, creating buddy systems, sharing best practice, all that good stuff can all be done remotely. It doesn't have to be done face to face. So I think um, sales leaders can do a good job of that if they just take the, take the blinkers off that it's just about revenue because it certainly isn't. And in my experience of having worked in field-based teams, what we found is that we all bounce ideas off ourselves as well when we were out there. Yeah. So not just relying on the manager and crikey, it would have been manna from heaven to have somebody manage like that, Rachel, because it was complete micromanagement, you know, and if you weren't doing this, that and the other, you were hauled into the office. That doesn't motivate people. Mm -hmm. Trust people to get on with it. That's why you employed them in the first place, isn't it? Surely. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things just to, just to share with everybody something that I know is working really well for, from our perspective in the business, but also for clients and just people in my network that I'm speaking with. And that is um, to, to sort of join the dots between if you're not quite ready for video, but you do want to speed up rapport and you do want to speed up conversion rate. And you're good on social media join the dots by using on linkedin bottom bottom right corner of the messages screen you've got a little microphone i go out for walks regularly as we all should be um and i will make contact with people using that little voice note option hi saw your article on linkedin loved it um hi i'm just out for my daily walk i'm thinking of you how how are things you know what what impact are you seen this week just find those tiny little reasons to make contact mm. and that can shorten the whole process of, you know, how many weeks it might take to close um, a sale, but it also helps to really connect from a rapport point of view and to show somebody that you're thinking of them. Yeah. Great thing is with that audio message as well, you can only leave a 60 second video, so it can't really turn into a sales pitch, yeah. which is great. <laughs> And also there are people you don't want to be kind of chucking loads of stuff into their inboxes all the time, but you want them to know you're thinking of them. They don't want a personal message on their, on their mobile. That's just a, on their mobile, that's wrong, you know what I mean, on their phone. They just want, it's just nice to know you thought of them and that it's, a, it's, it's good. It's a really charming and un, unobtrusive way of doing it, I think. I got a video from somebody yesterday that they'd made for me and that was really nice. And I opened his rather than all the other pictures because he'd, 
bothered to make a little video for me. It, and you do have to check sometimes, what's this video going to be? But yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was really nice. Um, yeah, and that's maybe that not, I'm a bit worried now about what I'm going to get sent, but yeah. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a pattern interrupt though, the fact that you've had something that you're not used to. So we get numerous messages every single day on LinkedIn trying to sell to us as soon as we connect. Yeah. And there's no bodying report there whatsoever. Whereas if you connect with someone, you send them a personalized message. Claire, really great to get connected with you. I think you're doing really fantastic posts. I'm really looking forward to engaging with you. You've instantly built that little bit of rapport. You watch it because it's a pattern interrupt and you get that, um, that nice feeling about it. So you've got that warm uh, approach. So we ditched cold calls just before COVID uh, and we, we went to online personalized videos where we'd reach out to people via LinkedIn Messenger and we had a 400% increase in demos off the back of just using video for outreach. Um, it's super powerful, it's untapped. And before everyone else jumps into it, it's a really great way of connecting with people and building that bonding rapport mm. from an organic and I, this, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna drop this into the conversation because I think it fits. Um, I listened to a talk a week or so ago for, from a guy um, suggesting that TikTok, yes, you heard it, TikTok is now being used massively for business generation, not just kids lip syncing. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, Andrew, Charlotte, Rach. Uh, TikTok's a, a bit of an untapped territory. Um, I think people are starting to go into it because they want to be the first to market and get right there. I think it all depends on what your target audience is. If your target audience is looking at the new millennials and gen the, the new generation, then it's definitely the place to really start building a presence while there's no one on it really getting that presence. Um, they're building ways of monetizing it at the moment. Uh, my, my sister put a video on TikTok about a, a lump on her head and she got 8.5 million views on it. So if she can do that, then it's definitely a good way of getting your message out there. But it all depends on, is that the type of audience that you want to get your message out in front of? Potentially not for us, so we're, we're staying away from it. But having stayed away from it, then you've always got the point of, oh, I wish I did that back then because now it's turned into a great stream for us. Because people are going from Facebook, now they're not on Facebook because Facebook is for the older generation, now they're on Instagram. Instagram might be for the older generation, then they turn to TikTok. So you kind of got to keep up with everything, but you can't be on all these channels because it takes forever, a lot of time to be able to keep, keep them all up. Yeah, that's an interesting one because I think people do think of that I want to go on TikTok just because I don't want to be the person who missed out but you're right you can't spread yourself too thin on social media wouldn't you say that Charlotte you do what you do well not try and sort of do everything not very well completely agree and like Andrew said depends on your audience but we would always recommend doing two channels really really well depending on who your audience are rather than trying to be everywhere absolutely I wanted to say to everybody, you know, calls, if you want any questions to be asked by the guys, please, or to ask the guys any questions, please put them in chat because Tudor is keeping an eye on it and, um, and coming up with and waiting to see and then sending me questions if I miss them. So I know you've asked yourself, Tudor, is everyone saying in a way that cold calling is, is dead? It's not going to work? Martin, Mr. Cold Caller? No, <laughs> Mr. Cold Caller. Um, cold calling isn't dead, no. In my opinion, no, of course it's not. But why on earth would you just cold call when there's so much information and resource out there to do a bit of research in the first place? You know, and, and I, I think I said this a week or so ago on Tudor's event. I was at a networking meeting, at a networking meeting, and the guy who ran it said via LinkedIn, he had direct messaged, yes, they were connected already, direct messaged the uh, marketing manager for Facebook in the UK on LinkedIn and got a response back because this person clearly is working from home the gatekeepers aren't gatekeeping mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a relationship kind of there already so why would you go through that cold calling process when you can do a bit of research and make it easy for people to find you with video and socials and stuff like that I presume you'd agree with that Rachel yeah, I think um, I'm pretty sure I've heard Martin say this as well. But when we um, when we're working with a sales team on a you know on a training program, we would usually say you reframe cold calling into warm calling because if it's cold, you're doing it wrong. It should always be warm, um, and there's many many ways that you can warm it up through research, through social media, through just planning that um, journey before the phone call. 
Um, and I think, you know, every, um, every successful salesperson and sales team needs to understand firstly who their customer is and why they might want to have that call or engagement um, and what the ideal sales pipeline might look like, what that ideal journey is and how many touch points and what do those touch points involve? You know, can they be calls, emails, social media? Do they have to be meetings? Now, obviously, we've got Zoom. We've got lots of other things that we can do. I mean, I love Andrew's points about, you know, putting video into your sales journey. So I think for me, it's not the calling part that's dead. It's the cold. The cold is dead. Anybody doing anything cold probably should expect to fail. Um, and if you know you're going to fail, why bother? So I'd say keep calling, but just do it in a warm way, not a cold way. Okay. I totally agree. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew, go, go for it. That's what I was going to say. I totally agree with that. It's what can you automate? What can you do, get to do a lot for you, right? So you can send out a video to a thousand people a day for very little effort and very little cost, right? So then you scoop up the ones that are kind of interested and you use that as your cold calling. That's your first kind of input. It's where does the cold calling sit in the funnel of how you bring people into your business? If you cold call first, then you've got to think that's the first touch point that they've got with you as a business <coughs> you prepared to do another 10 touch points before they come out to sell. That's a lot of effort. Why don't you automate the first half of that so you work on the second half? You, you become more productive and in turn you make more sales. Um, yeah, that's that warm. It's essentially what Rachel was saying. Yeah, the warm. You've warmed them up. Yeah. Yeah, you've, you've done that bit. Um, I, I think ultimately, nobody wants to do anything in sales. The reason that sometimes even the word sales puts fear in anybody is because we're all children at heart and we don't want to be rejected. Nobody wants to be rejected, whether that's not replying to an email, not answering a call, not returning a, a LinkedIn message. Nobody wants to feel rejected. And so we should design our journeys, our sales journeys, so that we have the limited, the most limited opportunity to be rejected as possible because then we feel better about doing it. And when you look at sales, when you call, like I said, when you call it sales, you almost feel like you're tricking someone into buying what you offer. But when you spin on his head and you actually, you have a solution that's massively going to benefit that individual, you're helping them. So what you do is you need to tell more people about what you're offering. And if that's more cold calls, then do more cold calls. If it's more video output, then you can just pay an extra bit of ad spend to reach a couple more thousand people. And once you know how you get them in, then it works really well. And it's how does that scale up to scale the sales team? We've won our two biggest clients from cold calling, but cold calling isn't a big part of our strategy. It's, it's th three processes in. It's once someone's made an initial touch point with us and seeing one of our videos to come through. We're more of an inbound than outbound kind of sales operation at the moment. And that shift really impacted our business. So your, I mean, Andrew, your style of, of selling is, is, you know, obviously going to be using video, which is what you're selling to people as well. So you're, you're in a perfect position because you're selling something that helps people promote themselves. You're promoting yourselves in the same way. And obviously you're using tech. And it sounds to me from what we're talking about, even with social media, you know, keeping abreast of this new technology and whether it's um, TikTok or video, whatever, that's the key. That's obviously what we're saying to people is it, you know, you need to be on top of all of this to make sales work well in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, what people potentially don't know about social media is behind social media gates, you've got access to their entire data, right? So you can actually send out a video to prospects based on their demographic, the company they work for, their job title, and then you pay a cost per thousand uh, to then reach those uh, potential prospects. And then if you use video, it unlocks a greater level, level of analytics, which means you can track just how engaged each viewer is. So did they watch 50% of the video, 95% of the video? And then I'm gonna send them a couple more pieces of video before they can even enter my prospecting line so that they've already warmed themselves up, they've qualified themselves in, and I know they're a hot prospect for us to have that initial contact with. Okay, so, so what about you on tech, Martin? Because, you know, that isn't necessarily how you've sold in the past. What do you think no. about keeping abreast of it all? I mean, you mentioned TikTok no, there. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I ain't doing TikTok videos yet, so don't worry. But, you know, I'll go back to Andrew's point, the third stage, is it then cold calling at all? Because you've already started to warm them up and is this concept just semantics? And I totally agree, Rachel, it's not cold calling it's generating future opportunities to do business you have to you, you know yes you've got to go with technology because your competitors are going to be doing that and if you're not doing it 
then you're going to miss out. But don't copy your competitors. This concept of pattern interrupt is massively powerful. You know, you do it on the phone call with the gatekeepers. You're pro I hate doing these things and you probably hate them as well. I don't suppose. They're not expecting that. Gatekeepers can hear a sales call coming from a 500 flipping miles away. They know what's coming. So be different. Um, a lot of my stuff is done from LinkedIn and from referrals and networking. So that's not suggesting I'm not open to technology and moving that way, moving forward, of course, because you've got to stick with the times. Mm. You're on mute, Claire. It's because there were teenage dramas going on in the background trying to nick my bank card <laughs> to turn it down. Um, it, do you think we're ever going to go back to the old way then? It seems like we are saying, yeah, cold calling is dead. Warm calling is the new thing. So are we going to go back to the old ways or not? Because we've been talking about pattern interrupt. Maybe that will have to happen in a year or two because we'll be bored of this way. I think that's a really interesting point that maybe in six months time, a call will be the pattern interrupt because you don't, you don't get that level of interaction at the moment. Um, yeah. I, I think there's still such a long way to go on how people are handling themselves on on linkedin or on social media in general um considering it is your networking event it is your referral uh, traffic i have an example i um i messaged a guy this week saying i've just discovered your podcast i think it looks brilliant it looks right up my street and i'm going to go back through the uh, the catalog um shortly um and to be honest i was angling for a slot on the podcast yeah. <laughs> um, and he replied straight away just with a thumbs up and it, it makes you think if you were if you were at a physical networking event and you took the time to go over to someone and speak to them and say love your podcast love what you're doing and they just stood there <laughs> I, I think you know the clue is in the word it's social media you still need to be social and you still need to be trying to you know, give something back to these people that come to you. It has to be a two-way, two-way street. It is very interesting. I know when I'm looking for potential clients on LinkedIn, and I just want to see what they're doing and what they're posting, so I can find out more about them. And they're not. They're just. They're literally just. Their engagements are thumbs up, and likes, and stuff. They're not saying much. The only stuff they share is very promotional for their industry, and it's very difficult. So I don't know anything about them. I have no communication with them, and it's quite hard to communicate and engage with them because they're not giving any. The only way you can engage is if they give you some and it's a bit of a, a one-way street and there's a lot of people yeah. who are still using social media that way Absolutely. So, yeah there was a question here um which is if you're not good at tech it's scary you don't want to do this you want to do the traditional sales because it's what you know it's i mean we're clearly saying you've, you've got to get someone who knows what they're talking about to hold your hand a bit you do have to invest a little bit in the tech expertise out there that's the only way forward presumably or is some of it self-taught is one of the ways forward, but if you've got the passion to learn it, then there's, there's plenty of courses out there genuinely to help you do it better yourself. And, and the thing with selling on social media in particular is it's your tone of voice, it's your product, potentially you're selling yourself if you're a trainer. So it, that to me would be scary to outsource to someone else trying to pretend to be me in a way. But I think if you have the passion to be salesy, there's very simple ways of doing that online by learning the tech. But I think you do need that passion to, to learn. If you're, if you're stuck in your ways, whatever they are, then that's a scary place to be. So you're, I mean, Andrew, you're one of these handholders, really, that I'm talking about because you do know what you're talking about. You have a platform that does it. You, your way is the quick way to do video. One of the questions actually somebody asked was, um, what's the kind of video that they should be producing? What, with people's attention spans are so so short if they are going to do this what should they be doing yeah so i think you've got you've got your organic video which is your you're helping you're adding value video they can be anywhere from 60 seconds up to two minutes i think past that point people stop to engage um from the paid advertising perspective we typically do anything from 15 to 30 second videos and no longer because from that point uh, we can track if they're engaged or not engaged. Our average view time is like six seconds. And so people are just trying to scroll through, see if your product meets their criteria, engage with it, then probably click the call to action. Then they would enter the sales funnel. So from the marketing side, yes, we've automated the content creation side. 
so that you guys can focus on the return investment you get from the funnels. So let's say you've got a six stage process of someone coming through to your pipeline. You can work out what your conversion rate is on each page, how many people sign up for a call, how many people attend the call, how many people sign your proposal based on your percentage of signing. Once you know your numbers, it's just a case of putting 100,000 people at the top and knowing what the sales are that are going to come out the other end. But yes, you're still going to need manual input from a sales team. But video can do that first half of funnel, warming them up and then bringing them through. Um, you, your content side of things, on paid advertising, you can be very, very salesy. But on an organic perspective, you have to add a huge amount of value. It's a six-month strategy where you need to be posting out a video every day, every other day to really capitalize on what the market is at the moment. LinkedIn's a great channel to do that. And the people that are investing their time into creating great, helpful content, they're going to be the winners after COVID because they get free organic traffic coming to them because they add value. We don't have the capacity to, to do that, I guess. So we focus more of our attention on the paid ads. How do we help people through that um, rather than the organic side? But it's definitely a, a good place to put a lot of time and attention into doing. And Claire, you're, you're really great for putting out really regular, helpful videos. So you'll see people coming through. Um, well, thank you. That's that's kind of I was looking at someone a bit too long now. When looking back, they do get a bit rambly. But it's interesting what you say there because you but you could still help people with their organic ones. They could still be using your branding process and so on. So it is a two way street. But when people are thinking about what to say organically, it's all very well to say I've got to go on social media. I've been told I must do it. Charlotte, what what do they say? I mean, you've made the the, the, val the content that they need to put in there needs to be valuable. But what can people do quickly and daily? on social media that would be getting themselves out there? Just have a think about the questions that people would ask you on the phone. So any question about your service, about how it works, about how you start, anything like that, any question that you would get, start building up a little FAQs and then answer those questions for everyone. But I think there's huge value in the answer, but then also seeing the whites of someone's eyes if they're gonna, if they're gonna do it on a video as well. There's, there's twofold value there. Okay. Somebody's asked about split testing. I don't even know what that is, but I'm presuming that's an Andrew question. <laughs> um, so yeah, split testing is massively important. You'll put out a video, you'll run it for a week, and then you'd look at the results. So you'd look at what your click-through rate is, what your cost per thousand is. So you can split test the audience that you're putting the video out to. Uh, and then you can also split test the creative. So what does the video look like? How much engagement does that video get? And if you change your color, if you change your title, the click-through rate can jump through the roof and you know you're onto a successful video. Once we go out with a paid advertising strategy, we can go out with m multiple videos, find out which one works best before we raise the budget on that one. And then you continually re reiterate your campaigns because over a period of time, it doesn't achieve the same effectiveness as when you set it up. So it's a, it's a case of just keeping an eye on it, using uh, 60 seconds to create new videos to put into the... Uh, into the funnel uh, and then find out what's worked for you and then what you can scale up. Okay. But yeah, split testing is really important. I hope everyone else understood more of that. Than I did. <laughs> <laughs> one to one for Andrew. Did you do that? Is that your, <laughs> your hair tutor or like what you thought? <laughs> yeah. No, I know it's all very important. It's just, I think, yeah, it's, the, it's quite techy. We are, I am realizing you can't do all of that on your own. You are going to. You're going to have a bit of help. Listen, I just wanted to point out, if anybody has to run because they had a time, it is 1.15 when the sense, ostensibly this is meant to end, but I think we've all still got stuff to chat about and talk about. So we're going to go on for about another 25, 25 15, 10, 15 minutes. So run away if you need to, but if not, do stay and let us know if you have any more, any more questions and things you want to talk about. I know, it, I suppose I'm trying to get a quick way for people here who could get started straight away without having to do video, without having to, um, because half the time it's the confidence that you build up, isn't it, by promoting yourself regularly and getting response and then you think, I'll try video because it is very scary. Rachel came up with that great one of leaving little calls. Um, Charlotte, you've been just saying like, even what just a text post, like a written post, common questions I get, these are the answers. Yeah, even a, even a written post, but I think with that, there should be regularity, there should be consistency. So start planning how much time you can dedicate to that and then do it three times a week and be consistent because it's all well and good putting out one amazing post, but it's only going to be seen, you know, X amount of times. You need to still be building that traffic to your LinkedIn or whatever it might be. 
So I'd say the key there is in the planning and then the consistency. Okay, so I'm going to open up to a few people in the audience and make you stick your hands up. What, are any of you got any little tips of how you're promoting yourselves online or something that's working for you or that you like other people doing? Or you're going to be deathly silent. You can do the little hand bits, I think, can't you? Stick your hand up. I think I've got all of you on the screen at the moment. No one, no one willing to share any of their secret tips? Mm. Anything that's really worked for somebody that they've done, even in the panel, anyone, that you think, I got really incredible engagement on this. And you think, Stories. Oh, stories you know don't say and, and uh, i can't remember who it was the memory of a goldfish but you just see certain sectors they just put offer after offer clear i think it was you after offer people don't like that you know if you have a conversation with somebody and they like what you say the chances are that other people will like what's been said so just start conversations add value be you yeah, the BU you've thing to, is very interesting. Sorry, you've Rachel. Got to, you've, you've got to be clear with what you actually want people to do. So if you're going to like flood content out there, that you, it's probably not going to be as successful as if you put smaller amounts, but you were very clear about what you wanted the audience to do on the receiving end of that content. And I think we should think carefully about whether we put content you know, speaking about social media, whether we put it on our personal profiles or whether we put it on our business accounts. And, and I know that there's, you know, differences of opinion around whether or not it's even worth having a branded business account. I think the only way to grow a business branded account is to share it from your profile, your personal profile, and to then talk positively about the business brand. But you need to be careful with how you, how you split the content. Is it something that you want to establish as, as you, as your voice, or is it, does it belong more with the business and what the business wants to say? And then if you're going to share it, you would then talk about how that relates to your viewpoint. So you get it out there twice, if that makes sense. Yeah. But the key, the key thing is not, not to just go, oh my God, I need to be techie. I need to do tech. You only need to do tech if your audience does tech. You know, you only need to do um, anything if that's what your buyer is going to respond to. And if your buyer isn't in any of those places, don't waste your time. Go where the buyer is and try to understand when they're in a shopping mood, you know, I'm a bit like you, Andrew, I, I don't want to go outbound. I, I prefer people to vote with their feet and come to me because I'm lazy. I, I know I can close every inquiry I get, but I don't want to just go out there and scream from the rooftops because that's much harder and it takes me more effort. and I haven't got that time to waste. So I think people vote with their feet. If they see something they like and they're in the buying mindset, we need to understand where do they look? Where do they go? Do they ask their friends for referrals? Do they go to Google? If so, our SEO has got to be absolutely bang on the money. Um, you know, where do people go when they're shopping for your service? Um, and I think that there's a big difference between concept and conquest. Mm -hmm. So if somebody needs to research a particular product or service because they're not yet fully sold on the concept of whether they need it, then it doesn't matter how much promotion that you do, it's going to fall on deaf ears. What you need to be doing with your content is selling the concept, educating the audience. Whereas if it's a conquest sale, then you're up against your competition and it matters whether your proposition looks better or cheaper or faster or more quality, whatever. So I think those two uh, concept and conquest that really should underpin our content strategy whether or not we're selling to somebody who needs educating on that particular topic or whether or not they're already buying it from somewhere else you know take phones for example we've all got a phone we all we all have a brand we all have a contract we all know what type of phone we've got and when we're shopping for a new one we don't need to be sold the concept of having a mobile phone because we all know we need a mobile phone. So you don't need to educate me on that. I'm bought in, I'm, I'm fully a signed up member, I have been for years. So it's a conquest sale. But if you were trying to sell me something that I've never used, never owned, not really quite sure if it's right for me, then you need to educate me on that first. So yeah, I think that is important. Cheryl, I think you had something to say there. It is, Rachel, thank you, that was really interesting. Yeah, I do completely agree, Rachel, and I think, I think the, the interesting thing about all of that is that what people want and need could be different now. So thinking about my clients, are they, are they just in survival mode 
or are they still trying to generate revenue are they trying to save time and I think like you mentioned about the content needs to it needs to speak to that specific customer but it needs to show that you understand what they're going through right now and I think that's something that Andrew will say you can get across on video and I think as well you can get it across in a number of different ways um, and I wanted to flag up a book which I think is really really good um, it's a book called Cash Vertising um, and from there they said people buy because of emotion and then they justify with logic and I think that's so important right now because emotions are all over the shop you know I, I will I bought a paint by numbers <laughs> because the advert looked really happy and they were doing it as a family and that really spoke to me because I thought that's that would be a lovely thing to do but that's completely different for, for me since six months ago and I think if you do wear your customers shoes what are they what are they worried about right now and that needs to be put across so quickly mm. Mm. I like that wear your customers shoes it's very true and um, although that's how I justify all my shoe shopping is that an emotion you bought them and then I have to justify well I, I needed to try your friend's shoes <laughs> yeah yeah, try her shoes. yeah that <laughs> Thank you all so much there. I'd be like, normally in moderator, you're just listening and it's on any kind of subject and answering the questions, but I'd be like jotting down notes about sales. So that's really useful. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Really what helpful. One of the most underused questions that um, people use in their sales conversations, because I think they're a bit, a bit afraid to ask questions that they don't know the answer to, because again, we don't want to be rejected. We stay in the safe zone. Um, but one of the best questions would be the question that my six-year-old would ask me regularly, why? Why? You know, why me? Why now? Why this? Why not that? You know, and, and when? And, and to really drill into, if you get the first answer and you still don't understand why, ask it again. There you go. Thank you. Find your why. <laughs> <laughs> but you really need to understand what somebody's motivations are for even being in your sales pipeline in the first place. And the more that they give you the answers, the more you've got something to work with. So I would say, you know, remember to ask why. And do you know what? Let's be honest. Do we all, as consumers, as we all are, do we always tell a salesperson the truth? Of course we don't. Because they're just salespeople. So that the same is true in reverse. Are your prospects always telling you the truth? No, they're not. So unless, as Rachel says, you dig... You're never going to get to the true buying motives. You might still sell, but you'll make it a hell of a lot harder for yourself if, unless you get to the real root cause of, of, of what's going on in that person's world right now. Just like when you view a house and you say that it's lovely, even though you hate it, you're right. You do as a customer. You Yeah. How's your dinner? Fine, thanks. I'm never yeah. coming here again. <laughs> you know. Oh, that's so British, though, isn't it? We need to make a <laughs> we finish everything on our plate in a restaurant because that's how we've been brought up. And then we go again. That was minging. Um, yeah, and it's bizarre. And tip the waiter as well, don't we? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, guys. It's been really, really interesting. I like that. You know, there's so many great things to take away. I don't wear your customers' shoes and the conflict and the con sorry, not conflict. It was conquest and concept. That edu you know, a lot of us are educating in, in our sales pitches, in our, in our advertising and promotion because it's required. But, you know, how nice if you didn't have to do that, I think. Um, thank you so much, everybody. So that was Rachel Howard, who is an expert from the sales coaching company Momentum Southwest. Martin Baines, the no-nonsense sales trainer. Social Bee's social media expert, Charlotte Travers. And, oh, you've got claps there. I thought it was a hand up from Tudor. And obviously the video marketing pro that is Andrew Bryce from 60 Seconds. I'm going to hand you back to Tudor now so he wants to tell you about the next event in the Edge webinar series. Thank you very much. That was brilliant, guys. Thank you. A virtual clap for you. For you. Excellent. Lots of stuff that we can take away. <laughs> yeah, I'm embracing new technology by um, doing that. That's, that's about as high, as high level as I go these days. Um, but yeah. There's loads of stuff we can take away from that. That was really, really useful. So thank you, Claire, as well. I really appreciate that. Um, Claire is going to be joining us on Wednesday at our next session. Um, and she's going to be talking about how you adopt your content to fit uh, a virtual audience and how you kind of um, up your presentation skills to kind of maintain engagement. Is that correct, Claire? Give us a thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and also we're going to have um, a gentleman called Horik Highland, who, um, funny enough, you mentioned this and this wasn't planted, but he's going to be talking about storytelling um, and how to um, build your elevator pitch and how to um, tweak it accordingly. So he runs a, a company called The Core Story, actually. Um, but thank you so much, guys, for, for joining us today. Um, and hope to see you on Wednesday. That was brilliant. I really, really found that useful. Hope you did too. Thank Thanks, you, Tudor. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Speak to you soon. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.